Just as a broad topic, what we're going to discuss is uh, what I would call the ancient astronaut theory, but specifically for tonight's workshop, I'm going to focus on pieces of technology that have been th uh, found throughout history, going back to the Sumerians and even before them, but put into a larger context of a view that shows man has probably been on Earth a lot longer than we think. At this point, it stands on the shoulders of the Sumerian culture for the first civilization. But all throughout history, we have megalithic monuments, uh, theories about an, Atl an Atlantean civilization, perhaps some ancient civilization that existed probably 10, 15,000 years ago, but finding the evidence for this culture on one continent or one specific site has eluded scholars. But as we'll see tonight, there could be a global evidence shown on all continents for a very superior technological co uh, culture or civilization that did exist at one time. So ancient technology. Uh, many of the artifacts that have come out of modern archaeological excavation still don't have an answer to what their full purpose could have been. This is an interesting uh, item known as the Antikythera mechanism. It was found by some sponge divers in 1908 off the coast of Antikythera. And uh, what's so interesting about this mechanism is that it's basically a handheld planetarium. Now, this under radar showed that it had over 38, between 38 and 70, different little cogs and wheels, more complicated than a modern day Swiss watch, yet it's over 2,000 years old. They don't know how it was made or who could have created it, but they give theories that possibly someone like Archimedes or someone in the great, uh, great uh, Greek time period would have had the knowledge to build this type of device, yet they really don't know for sure. But what's interesting about this is that it basically served two purposes. One, as an astronomical device where you could plot, ah, well, the North Star is close to Venus, and if I chart my court in this direction, you know, they could use this device to find out the positions of the planets. But it was also an astrological device so that it would tell the person who held this box, ah, well, if I was born today, 50 years ago, I can see that my sun, my sign is, you know, aligned with sun and Venus. And so back then, you know, 2,000 years ago, in the high, you know, Greek council, having astrological information to be able to tell people, oh, your planet sign is this, and you interact with Mars, was esoteric information. So this device served that purpose, yet it was 2,000 years removed from, you know, us trying to figure out who could have possibly built it. Here's a, a rendition of what it would have looked like inside of its, inside of its box. So another interesting area of, uh, information that I like to point out is Egypt. I'm going to kind of jump around from various parts of uh, the information tonight in the workshop because there's just so many of these pieces that when shown from their own aspect will fit into the bigger picture. Some of the artifacts shown in, in Dendera in Egypt, we have tombs and recesses, uh, dark crypts all over Egypt that have intricate hieroglyphs on all, over the, all over the walls and the ceiling and you know Egyptologists will say, oh well you know, if there's no evidence of flame, no carbon burning or soot on the ceiling, how are they lighting, how are they lighting in these dark recesses to actually see to carve these hieroglyphs or to paint them? The only other theory aside from, uh, you know, a torch would be cop copper reflective mirrors. Now, copper can only reflect so far down these shafts, so an alternative theory is they had electricity. You can see what they're clearly holding up here, what looks like a light bulb, and it's actually plugged into some type of device. Now, modern archaeologists today say, oh, well, this is an eggplant. They're holding up an eggplant symbolically. Okay. Well, to me, it looks like uh, a very large, what could be attributed as a light bulb. Now, what I did was, in the same time period of the Egyptian culture, which is roughly 2500 BC, we've also found another interesting artifact, which has been known as the Baghdad Battery. And so I've come up with a theory that in the, in the same time period of the Egyptian culture, in that same era, we have the Sumerian civilization. And in their own rise to technology, we've discovered over a dozen of what are called the Baghdad batteries, which is basically a 4,000-year-old battery. It's a copper jar with a, uh, a copper, excuse me, a, a clay jar with a copper lining, an iron rod down the center. And if you fill it with a weak acidic, acidic uh, liquid like grape juice or vinegar, lemon juice, and you touch the copper and the iron, you get a positive charge. Now, Eric von Daniken actually made a relief of what's shown on the wall 
and had done a, had done a test where he, he created a light bulb and, and powered it just to scale as shown on the wall, and it actually functioned. It worked. Now, here's an actual picture of the Baghdad battery was, of what was found. I recently did an on-camera experiment for the Discovery Channel where I, I generated positive four full volts consistently using a replicated battery shown here in the, left, in the far right corner. And you now, if you figure four volts from one of these, you stack up two or three of these, you instantly get up to a nine volt, 12 volt battery, which could power what we have today in our modern devices like flashlights. So you combine this with something like that, and maybe possibly an alternative view was that they actually were harnessing electricity. The other theory is that archaeologists today say, okay, maybe they had a battery. But the only thing that we would accept that they would be using this for would be electroplating, so that you could basically heat up silver, gold, and then spray it over jewelry and find precious elements, which they have a lot of evidence to show that that's what it was being used for. This is an alternative view for what it could, be, could have been used for. And you can see here, again, just a little... Uh, show, you know, showing that you put, put these two positive negatives on the voltmeter and you would get a, a positive charge. So ancient engineering, unexplainable archaeology. This kind of goes again, again into the theory of an Atlantean culture. You know, maybe someone predating the oldest civilization of which we'll get deeply into here, the Sumerian culture. But there's evidence all over the earth of these megalithic monuments that are left to cultures that have then built on their civilizations on top of it. So in, so in South America, for instance, uh, Tiwanaku, uh, Teotihuacan, we have many of these sites with megalithic monuments that we can't explain who built them. And if you were to ask the Mayans or the Incas or the Taltecs, you know, who built these structures, they say, oh, well, these were built by Kuku Khan or Quetzalcoatl, you know, or the, the gods. They, they say that there was another great civilization that was here that predated them, yet what's the evidence to show that they existed? Where did they go? So what I point out is that we have, we have these megalithic structures all over the earth that when looked at closely, there's no explanation for how they got there. Here are stones found in Pumapuku, which basically fit together like Legos. They're built in such an intricate way, carved such a way, so that they would fit together. You can see here also, there was melting liquid metal poured uh, to connect these devices. Amazing technology for a culture that's 4,000 years old. And you can see here, this larger one, there's symmetrical drilled holes, precision drilled holes throughout the stone. And there's no way to do this without modern technology of some type of a drill. Yet here it is and stands for all time with evidence to see. So there's stones all around the world, these megalithic sto stones. This is a great image because it's actually Ted. I believe this is the image of Ted here who's filming somewhere back here uh, on the left. Uh, and this is a, you know, a trip that they took some, some, some people with Zachariah Sitchin. And uh, you know, this is a stone that's in Baalbek in Lebanon. Now what's so interesting about this is that we have stacked uh, you know, several miles from this quarry site, these stones that are trilithoton stones, huge stacked stones. Let me just stay on this image for a minute. And this is where the quarry site of where the stones were taken from because here's one that, was un that broke and they left it at the quarry site. There's no way physically today for us to get into a rock that large, wedge in there and somehow lift it out. These are like 100,000 tons. So there's just no way possible that through our own feats of technology today that we could even build something like this or the pyramids in Egypt. So that's where we go into the next thing here is the pyramid connection. All around the world there are pyramidal structures on every continent and there's really no explanation for how they were built or why they were built. You'll hear that possibly the Egyptians used this as you know, ceremonial tombs for the pharaohs, yet the king's chamber and the queen's chamber and the great pyramid have no evidence of hieroglyphics. And you'd think that if it was a king or a queen being buried in a pyramid, the walls would be inscribed full of praise to the king or the pharaoh. That's not the case. So there's all types of alternative views that say maybe the pyramids have been used for some type of advanced energy harnessing system, uh, some type of way to tap into an energy source. But we really don't have an answer for who really built the pyramids or what their purpose was. So, when we start to look around the world, specifically starting in South America, we have evidence of archaeological sites pointing to astronomical locations 
and set out in a way where it's been designed to point towards certain astronomical alignments. What's really interesting about the South American uh, pyramids is that it's theorized that there's literally a pyramid for every planet in our known solar system and that these actually are plotting the various planets that we have. Now, this isn't a widely known or accepted view, but the interesting thing is that these pyramids are known as the Pyramid of the Moon, the Pyramid of the Sun. They do have a correlation to an astronomical terminology. So it's an interesting you know, layout when we look at the sophistication and the grandeur of something built by a culture that's, you know, again, what we don't attribute to you know, Stone Age cultures or primitive technology, yet they have knowledge that's been displayed in a way where now with our sciences and understandings we can look at this and use radar and mapping, look at the telemetry and say, well, wait a minute, how could they have known that this is actually one-tenth of a degree off to the true north? So some of these pyramids, again, the Great Pyramid of the Sun, uh, it's a very interesting coincidence that the base of the Pyramid of the Sun and the base of the Pyramid in Giza are very close in, in scale. And when you look through, again, some of these pyramids, you know, this is, this is uh, very comparable to the Egyptian size and mass, but there's really no explanation for what they were being used for other than other previous cultures of them come, you know, in South America, Mayans, uh, the Taltecs, Aztecs, and have, and have come in and, you know, taken over these lands for, and these monuments for themselves, assuming that they were built by their ancestors. But when we start to get in some of these more interesting, well-known uh, structures like the Three Giza Pyramids, there's a lot of unanswered questions because if the pyramids were built by the Egyptians 2500 BC, roughly, you know, 4500 years ago, then how is it possible that there's alignments taking place here that just can't be explained in that time period. What we have here is satellite data that shows the three Giza pyramids, and then what we have is a constellation of Orion, the three stars of Orion, so that in the year 10,500 BC, using computer mapping software on your PC, Redshift, various programs, you can chart where the stars are going to be in the heavens forwards in time and also backwards in time so that maybe in a week from now I can say, oh look, Orion's going to be right above my house. Cool, I can go out and see it. You can also roll the clock back in time. It turns out in 10,500 BC, the pyramids form a terrestrial map of Orion. They are exactly lined up with the pyramid offset just like Orion, perfectly matching in 10,500 BC, mimicking what it sees in the sky. Also, the Sphinx at that exact date is looking east at the constellation of Leo, which is basically in the formation of a lion. So in 10,500 BC, we have a terrestrial alignment with the structures in Giza to constellations in the sky. Now, what's the purpose of that other than to say, well, it's very possible then, based upon also geological evidence, that the pyramid and the Sphinx are way older than 4,500 BC, as it is, you know, with the Egyptian culture having to carry these stones at their weight, 20 stones a day, 24 hours a day, there's just no way in the 20-year time period of the dynasty that the pyramid could have been completed. But it's interesting to also note that the Sphinx has very significant weathering on the sides and walls of the Sphinx uh, enclosure where it's been heavily inundated with rain. Now, there's no evidence for rain on the Giza Plateau for maybe 10,000 years. So, it starts to line up a different picture for we look at all these structures all over the earth that have megalithic precisions to astronomical alignments where all the cultures previously coming in you know, contact with this say, oh, well, our ancestors built this and it's a you know, power of their revered knowledge. But basically all they can do is point to the gods that taught them this information. So one of the things that I'm going to start to lead and show you is that if you're an ancient person living in a clay hut and using stone tools and all of a sudden you see a firmament in the sky or Ezekiel wheel within wheels and some type of craft is ascending and a being steps out and says, hello. They didn't understand. And they said, you know, you're a god. How can this be? Now these same reports happening today, we call them alien abduction. And there's just a much higher level of involvement on, you know, society's acceptance of this idea. But as you'll see, you know, it's not such a far-fetched idea when we start to look at all these artifacts and evidence that point to the fact that ancient man was witnessing 
and had knowledge that they couldn't have just learned on their own. Here's an unfinished pyramid in Egypt, which is uh, a very interesting, uh, very interesting undertaking. They, they saw that the sides of the pyramid started to slant in a direction where they couldn't support it, so they stopped building. So uh, another interesting part of this, again, is the ancient astronomy. A lot of these megalithic sites excuse me, are aligned to astronomical precision points. So when we look at some of these cultures, the Egyptians and the Sumerians, and dive into this knowledge, the 12 houses of the zodiac, where does this information come from, and what does it actually mean? What was it being used for? What's the significance of this? One thing I would state is um, the Sumerians, as you know, we'll talk about here, being the first civil civilized culture to show up, were the ones who actually were the first ones to denote 12 parts of the heavens and divide them into zodiacs. And the way this works is very simple. Just like you would hear, we're in, the, we're in the age of Aquarius or in the age of Pisces. The way that would work was simply that right at the time of Halecleal rising, which is when you go out early in the morning and the sun is just about to pop up over the horizon and it hasn't yet and you can still see the stars against the backdrop of the sky. Well, what happens is, is when the sun starts to rise, if you can see, for instance, the constellation of Aquarius, whatever constellation the sun is rising in front of, you say, oh, we're in the age of Aquarius, we're in the age of Pisces. So it was a very interesting division of the heavens into 12 parts. But this knowledge is shown to have been held by high priests and courts from cultures, not just the Greeks and the Romans or the Egyptians, but it goes way all the way back into the Sumerians, as I'll show having the first uh, you know, in, in invention of this knowledge. But some of these cultures show knowledge of astronomy that it, uh, you know, it boggles and it really is hard to put into perspective. The Egyptians, for instance, have not only a view of the 12 houses of the zodiac or a divisional breakdown of the heavens, but they also took a much farther back view and had artifacts and replica elements that actually showed our position within the universe, where it wasn't just our solar system or our, or our uh, galaxy. It was a whole breakdown view, much larger out, which would show various other points in the universe. And these were inscribed on tablets and stones where archaeologists have now broken down and visually found representations of the zodiac signs, but in a much more narrowed down view, where the view is in a much more expanded view of what they're explaining, and they've only identified the symbols that we know of in our zodiac, but it's a much more larger view that encompasses an astronomical layout that boggles modern archaeologists, and they really aren't able to accept a lot of the things that are presented, which we'll get into. So these artifacts still on display, and, you know, again, they, uh, you know, the archaeological community will accept zodiacal symbols, but the, uh, the large view of how they could have known the position in the universe or in our solar system really, really just kind of boggles modern science. So you can see various points of reference for these, uh, these diagrams and the clarity of what they're showing. You know, this is one zodiacal uh, set, just like it would be, you know, changing in a, in a calendar. So again, the division of the heavens into 12 parts, a very interesting uh, number, 12, why 12? Where does this information come from? And as we'll see, the number 12 is a very pivotal number, a pivotal number of information stemming from the Sumerian culture. Now this is a Sumerian uh, tablet that's roughly 4,500 years old, and you can see that it has symbols representing like the scorpion, and you can see the, the turtle there and various other symbols that are known to be astronomical symbols. The turtle isn't one, but uh, various uh, astronomical data coming out of the Sumerian culture where this was the earliest known sources of this information. So another interesting part of the tale for you know, ancient technology coming out of these cultures, again, we have these megalithic monuments, astronomical alignments, and stories coming out from just about every culture on Earth of a time when man had interaction with their living gods. Just like in the Bible, we hear about there were once a, a, a time when there were giants upon the earth. So what we also have is all around the world, we have depictions of flight, meaning artifacts, depictions, wall release that show man depicting what he viewed as flight. Now, again, if you're living in a clay hut and using stone tools, anything flying in the sky was alive. It was a bird. They didn't even have hot air balloons. So when we have these depictions of flight, and more specifically people coming down with the power of flight, 
it starts to raise the question of, well, what, what were they trying to tell us? Were they looking at bird men? No. Interestingly enough, though, archaeologists, uh, when they first started doing excavations in Iraq in the early, actually late 1800s and early 1900s, the archaeologists see all these wall reliefs and descriptions of what the, of the Sumerians called their gods, which was labeled Anunnaki. And the term Anunnaki just simply means those who from heaven come to earth. But the archaeologists didn't understand what the Anunnaki could have meant. They're pulling out tablets that show descriptions of the outer planets, the distance of the outer planets between, you know, how, how far is the distance between these planets. We didn't discover Pluto until 1930. So in the early 1900s, the archaeologists start finding all these re relics of the Anunnaki. They labeled them birdmen and said, oh, well, this is the Sumerian legacy of their mythology, talking about how they inscribed their creation myth. And so here's the change of information that we take from scholars like myself and Zachariah Sitch and Eric von Daniken, is that modern archaeology says every culture has a creation myth. It's a, it's, a, it's a story told to young children about how we get here. Well, what if these stories are actually fact, based upon ancient man's references available at that time? Anything flying you know, alive in the skies uh, wasn't something they could attribute with a technological reference. So they would give it a spiritual reference to say, wings, power of flight. Just like the Egyptians and the sun god Ra, this is carried over, but the original view of this winged disc, which we'll talk about further as we go into this, but this description by the Sumerians of a winged disc was something that carried over into other cultures like the Egyptian culture and Akkadian cultures as this uh, symbol for some type of divine intervention coming down and using this form of symbology. This is a Sumerian god known as Ishtar or also Inanna that came down and there's actually a Sumerian tale of how Inanna liked to fly the skies of earth and one day she chose a Sumerian king Gilgamesh that she found attractive and wanted to take him up into her abode in the sky and he said thank you but no thanks because all the men that go up with you never come back and are turned up dead so thanks but no thanks. And this is an actual Sumerian tale that's, you know, talking about Ishtar. Very interesting things that talk, uh, that come out of the Sumerian culture uh, that, you know, we still use today. They were over 100, they have over 100 of the firsts attributed to what we use in a civilized culture. Courts, laws, systems of judges, uh, school education, medical science, astronomy, agriculture, writing, mathematics, and information about their living gods as to how they attributed all the information they gained they said they learned from the Anunnaki. So looking at some of these other references for the power of flight, looking at the Egyptians and the Sumerians, we also have cultures around on other continents. Here's another thing found in a, a tomb. Um, this was found in the uh, uh, tomb in Saqqara, Egypt, uh, found to be dated around 200 BC and the Cairo Museum basically labeled this uh, a wooden bird model until someone that was doing excavations and was interested in artifacts that showed power of ancient technology or power of flight from various cultures said, hey, look, there's other artifacts that maybe show this could be a representation of, a, of an airplane. Because also we have in South America pre-Columbian civilizations that have these small models that are on display as insects, flying insects. Well. When, it, when we put it into a larger perspective, you know, we can start to see that there might be a similarity being shown here of artifacts being displayed by ancient man where maybe ancient man wasn't actually piloting these craft, but it's something they were seeing and were trying to replicate. Now, here's another fact that I would point out is that we have something today's cultures call a cargo cult. So in, in, uh, right after World War I, when American soldiers flew into remote areas like southern Africa, and came across aboriginal tribes. You know, they, they, they land in their prop plane and, and get out, and light up a cigarette, and have a voice recorder and step up to the aboriginal and, hala -ba -la -la -ba, and they record his voice and play it back to him. And he, he's amazed. You have voice recorder and lighters and flying machines. They thought they were gods. And so when the soldiers packed up their camp and left to come back here, the aborigines made straw models of these planes and scraped away runways and started worshiping the plane in hopes that the gods would come back. So that same story is shown here by ancient cultures where they must have been witnessing something 
by trying to replicate and explain, but with only the knowledge they had available at that time. No technological references, only spiritual or things in nature by giving it wings to say it had the power of flight. So very interesting artifacts. Here's another one found by Zachariah Sitchin, uh, held in a Turkish, mu uh, Turkish museum, and it was not on display. The curator was convinced by Zachariah Sitchin to put it on display and label it, you know, the headless... Uh, actually, I'm not sure, I think it's just an unknown description, but Sitchin in his book labels this the headless spaceman, and you can see it has very rocket-like characteristics, very similar to the space shuttle, but in here, where we see the thrusters in the back, it looks like there could be a gentleman seated, only he's missing a head, so they call it, you know, the headless spaceman. But very interesting artifact that just appears where, where's the reference point? Well, we're starting to see a perspective here. Another interesting artifact that just found, uh, you know, found uh, some interesting relevance of rising up to, you know, something in the sky. No real significance other than I just thought it was an interesting artifact. So another area of, you know, getting in more into the ancient, or more into modern times of ancient descriptions of technology being witnessed, yet what's the context, is through Renaissance artwork. Um, various places in Yugoslavia and um, in Renaissance artwork in Italy and places that we'll look at, there's descriptions and things being shown where if you look a little closer, you start to see stuff that, hmm, what does this mean? Here is a monastery in Yugoslavia that you can see here is a very, very fine fresco that was done in, somewhere in the, in the realm of 1539, and it's a depiction of Jesus on the cross. But here we have in the backdrop of this strange aerial, aerial uh, phenomenon being piloted by humans. And if you look closely at what's going on here, you can see that there are you know, several craft, and there's obviously someone in there piloting it, you can see that the actual uh, other people in this painting are looking up at this in awe and are actually shielding their face, going, oh, we see it, and you'll, you'll see this here in a minute. But it's a very interesting uh, fresco that shows information that, again, you know, what, what would they be depicting beings flying in the skies for? And obviously, you know, everyone's scared or is, you know, paying attention to what's happening. So this starts to raise the question of, you know, what was ancient man witnessing in the skies? And when we start to look at some of these wall reliefs, it really starts to raise the question of, you know, are these actually, is it God that they're witnessing, or is this possibly just their understanding, of their lack of understanding for interpretation of what they were witnessing? Here's another interesting uh, uh, painting of the Madonna, and uh, by, uh, I believe it's St. Giovanni, and you can see here, very interesting religious painting, but as a backdrop to the painting, watch this. Look over her left shoulder. You see a gentleman with a dog shielding his eye and looking up in the sky at something. What could that be? <laughs> well, it looks very much to be some type of glowing or gaseous emitting craft that has enough attention so that the dog and the gentleman are looking up, and the artist made such a point to put that type of detail into the picture. And a lot of these artifacts are shown throughout religious artwork and, and in Renaissance artwork that really hasn't been scrutinized or looked at from this angle of what was the artist trying to tell us. Very interesting. And so this is nothing new. There are stories all throughout Renaissance artwork that to say that there were glowing shields in the sky that attacked us, you know, and so these depictions put into a different context start to raise the question of, you know, the same things that we report today as UFOs or unknown lights in the sky, we have a little bit more of a broader understanding of our views in technology to give a review of what, you know, what we see. So when we go all the way back to the Sumerian culture, which is kind of the pinnacle point of what I focused on in my research, we start to see that even though the Sumerian culture is on record as being the first culture or civilization we have record of, there's texts that go way, you know, 10,000 years back in ancient India and stories of Vimana and crafts that circled our earth and let down smaller crafts and stories of the gods, how they fought in our atmosphere around the earth. But the only, the only great civilization that we have as a complete civilized culture 
rests on the shoulders of the Sumerian culture, meaning they've left us artifacts, uh, sites, the city of Ur, texts, a complete package to put into perspective what was going on in their time frame. So it's a very interesting tale because as one of the famous authors, Zachariah Sitchin, taught us, you know, modern archaeologists will squabble over one phrase, over one word, Elohim, Anunnaki, and they didn't put it into a larger perspective of what the overall tale is being told here of our history. So there's a lot of discrepancies for when we start to think about extraterrestrial intervention or theories not accepted by archaeology and mainstream science because where is it? Show me the alien. Show me the UFO. Well, you just have to look a little closer and be open-minded to the fact that ancient man didn't understand technology. But put through, the, put through the eyes of what we now understand as technology, were these actually gods that they were interacting with or possibly just more advanced technologically and spiritual beings that came here and, came here and influenced us? I will say one other thing, too, is you know, the Anunnaki spoke about this, that they believe in a, a force greater than theirs, a life force. But you know, a lot of people religiously, me being raised as a Christian, hard to grapple with the idea that there could be aliens or extraterrestrials possibly that had a hand in our creation. But that doesn't mean that they're the gods. It just means that they're the gods with the small g. Someone still had to create them. Where did the Anunnaki come from? So it just goes higher and higher up the chain of uh, more unanswered questions. But uh, we can clearly see that some of these stories told by the ancient cultures really do have a reverence of importance when put into the realm of these are events that actually took place. If Jesus, as a re, you know, a renowned spiritual being, was here, where did he come from? It's not enough for me to say he just came from heaven. I don't know where heaven is. So we find information put into a different perspective that gives us more details. The Sumerians have many tales that parallel biblical t biblical texts, and, and we'll discuss some of these. But for instance, the creation stories, how we got here. For instance, in the Bible, there are seven days of creation. It's a condensed story of how we got here. The Sumerians have seven tablets called the Atrihasis tale of creation, a much more lengthy description, exactly paralleling the modern day description in Genesis, but it's on a stone tablet, 4,000 years before any written language. So a lot of these artifacts that we show and see in Sumerian form start to lead us down a path of, okay, well, wait a minute, what does this really mean? The Sumerians had a very ingenious way of writing, too. They basically took an oversized screwdriver called a stylus and would twist it and turn it in wet clay, and then they would take this clay tablet, stick it in something called a kelm, a stove, and would fire it up, making it into stone, literally keying that phrase, writing in stone. What's interesting, though, is with our 26-letter alphabet, we think, are so, we think we're so proficient, and the Sumerian cuneiform alphabet consisted of over 400 characters. Right out of the Stone Age, the first written language, you can look this up, people, the first written language is cuneiform script, 400 character alphabet. Nice. So we start to look at some of the things that they wrote. They would sometimes also write on semi-precious stones. They had another form of written language. Let me just back up a couple slides to show you this thing here on the left. This is a cylinder seal. They had another form of written language where they would also reverse carve hieroglyphics or pictograms on what they call the cylinder seal. So they can then roll that over wet clay and leave a positive imprint and they could easily disseminate information like, a, like a, an ancient printing press. So they had cylinder seals and tablets of information and there are still thousands of tablets stored in the British Museum and in the Louvre that are not on public display or haven't even been referenced by linguists that can study cuneiform script. There's only about 200 people in the world Zachariah Sitchin being one of them, that can directly translate cuneiform script. So there are thousands of tablets still left in archives of information that, as we'll see, could hold miracle information, medical knowledge. Maybe there's some plant that we don't know about. You eat and it cures cancer. I don't know. But as we'll see, the information they bequeath in other areas about their interaction with their gods, the astronomical data that they had, we can ver well, the astronomical data at least, we can verify what they were saying. So... Some of the tablets uh, recorded astronomical events over hundreds of years. They would be able to tell you cycles of what they were seeing in the heavens over hundreds of years. For instance, this is one of the tablets that 
uh, there were basically high priests and what were called scribes. So a scribe was someone who could read and write cuneiform, very privileged honor. Not everyone could read and write uh, cuneiform script. A priest would work with a scribe and would record sacred information. And whoever could read and write and know this would be able to tell you things like 50 years in advance on what specific day there would be a lunar eclipse. So that 50 years in advance they would know on this day there'll be an eclipse. And they recorded this information on tablets that we now have in our possession and can look at and say, wow, how did they know this? Well, another interesting feat is the mathematical system that they used. It's called sexagesimal. We basically call that 60, but what it really was was the division of 6 and 10, two separate numbers to do very fine, intricate, and large-scale numbers of geometry so that you could break down and get very fine, intricate numbers. This is a plot that showed burial uh, uh, land, land being divided so that if, if I am a man and I have a certain amount of land and I have aunts and uncles, uncles and brothers and sisters, these were breakdowns mathematically based upon their wealth of how much land they would get. And you can see it was very complex in, in how they would break uh, some of these systems and angles down. Now the interesting thing about the Sumerian mathematical system is that we still use a lot of this today. The sexagesimal are based upon 6 and, six and uh, 10. There's all, all kinds of this breakdown of 60 that we still use today. Now, they also had a very another, another key number, which was 12. And we'll talk about this as we get into it. But they basically were the first ones to do, divide uh, or to have 12 hours in a day, a double day and night, 12 hours in a day, 12 hours in a night, 12 inches in a foot, 12 in a dozen. Um, the Sumerians were the first ones to say that we actually have not nine planets in our solar system, but 12. They counted a solar system that was made up of 12 planets. And this is a key part of the Sumerian tale because it involves another planet which we have not located yet, which we've maybe heard about called Planet X or Nibiru by the ancient cultures, what they called it, Nibiru, which simply means planet of the crossing. So in the very early times of the Sumerian culture, they have stone artifacts. I might have one in here that actually shows a glowing cross in the sky. Now this is 4,000 years before Christianity, yet they symbolize this, this planet where their gods came from as a glowing cross in the sky. How's that for some similarities with the Christian Jesus on the cross? So we start to look at this breakdown of 12 months in a year, 12 hours in a day, 12 in a dozen, 12 planets in our solar system, 12 disciples of Jesus, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 Greek, Olymp uh, Greek Olympians, well, the Sumerians' knowledge of 12 planets in our solar system and their gods coming from the 12th planet starts to really start to tip the scale of one or two coincidences, okay, but 15 or 20, wait a minute. So Sumerian astronomy, they actually have tales and tablets that describe the distance between our planets and what they look like in space. Now, we didn't know what the planets looked like until we sent Galileo and Voyager in the early 80s, excuse me, late 70s, early 80s, and took color images of the outer planets, we, we, you know, we were able to see uh, Uranus is a bluish green planet. It, it looks similar uh, to, uh, to Pluto. And so this information was recorded by the Sumerians. They actually have depictions for all of our planets. Here is a seal, a very, I'm not really sure what it's telling us other than what it's showing is what you see here is a cross representing Nibiru, the planet Nibiru, and the seven dots of Earth and our crescent moon. Now, they called our Earth the seventh planet. And we'll, I'm skipping ahead of the slide, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, but we'll see it in a minute on the slide. They called our Earth the seventh planet. Now, you think third rock from the sun, that cool terminology. No, because if you're starting from outside of our solar, solar system, Pluto, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, I'm getting that wrong, Jupiter, Mars, Earth, as you come in, counting outward in, we are actually on the seventh planet. So that sacred number seven, seven days in a week, uh, very interesting terminology that describes us as being the seventh planet. And here you can see us depicting, them depicting the seven dots of Earth and our crescent moon and Nibiru and its crescent moon. So this kind of leads into an overall uh, topic of what's known as the ancient astronaut theory, that basically all cultures around the world talk about a time when gods visited ancient man. When we hear about descriptions of these, we hear things like chariots of fire, or Ezekiel's wheel, a firmament within the heavens, a, f a solid mass within the heavens is what they're saying. They didn't have any way to describe what they were saying, whereas today we would be like, it's a UFO. You know, it's, we, we have a 
different terminology, but it's the same explanation being given. It's some type of conveyance of a craft being piloted by beings like us. So we start to look at these tales of angels in the Bible and see a similarity of the descriptions of the Anunnaki by the Sumerians, but in a much earlier context because, well, the chicken and the egg syndrome here is clear. The Sumerians are stone tablets, and the Christian and the Old Testament are tales that have been, comp, uh, you know, been compiled over time, but here we have the source tales coming from the Sumerian culture. So this kind of really started to sum up questions I had as a Christian for, you know, where is heaven, you know? I'm just told it's up there somewhere. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. So a lot of the information that came from the Sumerian culture gets to, gets to be very specific and parallels a lot of the modern biblical tales for where we come from. A lot of these depictions and, and, and wall reliefs I found to be very interesting. Here we have a depiction of uh, an Anunnaki coming de down to meet a Sumerian king showing again some type of conveyance of the power of flight. I always make the joke that these are taxpayers holding up the platform so that this can actually take, this can actually take place. <laughs> Good old taxpayers. But, uh, you know, this is a, a, a common theme where the power of flight or some type of conveyance of flight is being shown throughout, throughout these Middle Eastern cultures and specifically stemming from Sumer. Now, this filters into Akkadian and other other cultures of this, this winged disc of the symbol you see here in the bottom, but it comes from the Sumerian culture of the Anunnaki. And these wall reliefs are, are found all over Iraq and all over Iran. This is in Persopolis. I hope that one day, you know, I'm such a big advocate of this information, that I would like to be able to, in my lifetime, travel to Iraq and stand on the solid ground and see these and touch this for myself. You know, I mean, this is amazing information that, you know, our own heritage of where we come from has now ramifications for being destroyed by, you know, the current war that's been taking place. And there's been a lot of anomalous information surrounding um, our interest into these ancient cultures. And, you know, there were stories about Saddam being very interested in, <coughs> excuse me, building monuments to worship the Anunnaki, like a theme park. And he wanted to collect the, the artifacts found in southern Iraq were basically taken by the British Museum and they have them on display. And the representatives of the Iraqi uh, Republic had, had contacted the British Museum and said, hey, look, we don't want all these reliefs of copies. We want the originals back, you know. So there was a lot of uh, stories that actually Saddam Hussein had come across alien technology just like we have. And this is a whole other wide range of topics that we could discuss, but... I'm a firm believer in the field of ufology and evidence shows that the U.S. has been involved in this for a very long time, extraterrestrial advanced technology. So if Saddam got his hands on some of this, it seems very possible that we'd want to get in there and take it out of his hands before he would be able to use it in any type of threat. Um, so throughout, throughout the, the, the history of, of Sumerian times, you know, there's these inscriptions and wall reliefs of them depicting, again, you see the taxpayers holding up the king, uh, this interaction taking place of the gods coming down and interacting with the Sumerian kings. Now, another thing I'd point out is a lot of the things we hear in like Christianity of don't worship false idols and how could there be multiple gods. Some of the tales explain to us as the Sumerians go that the Anunnaki, when they came here, again, being living beings, created us in their image and after their likeness. So they took the Neanderthal man that was living here naturally, the hominoid, and combine their genes with this hominoid to make us in their image and after their likeness, to be their slaves, if you will, to be their workers. And this information, again, is uh, really interesting when put into the context of when we read the Bible or some of these tales that, again, like 60% of North Americans believe in this type of information of spirituality that, you know, what if this is factual information, that there was a time when we were interacting with beings that were basically not from Earth? And we just, we haven't experienced that yet uh, in, in our lifetime. But all these wall reliefs and depictions, which I focused on from the Sumerian culture, tell of a time when it was ample, you know, they, they were here and they existed among us. But what happened was, is this was a very sacred passage of knowledge, just like you see in uh, Mel Gibson's new movie, you know, where there's a, a high priest standing on a Mayan temple, you know, he's the man up top of the pyramid. Well, these high priests were getting information from the Anunnaki and were taking down sacred knowledge. And all of a sudden, for whatever reasons, the Anunnaki had wars against each other. 
put their people against each other, rivaling clans, and then left for whatever, for, for whatever reasons. And so now these high priests are left in the position of, well, who do we worship? How, how do we go get our sacred information? And so it started to be that they would worship various depictions and law reliefs of the various Anunnaki that come out of the Sumerian legacy of information that explain how you can see how they'd start to worship an idol of the god where the priest would have no one to turn to because the god has left him with no other choice but to guide the people in the best way that he saw fit, which was let's worship the statues since it's the closest thing we have of them. But an interesting thing with, with, with what we see with the symbology here is again that they're depicting them with wings. Now again, archaeologists said that these were bird men and they didn't understand what they were, what they were seeing. Well, I make the, sim the symbolic reference of saying they were just showing that they had, the, they had the power of flight because if we look at today's modern symbolic references for the power of flight, here we have Apollo 11, you know, the first astronaut landing, and it's an eagle. Houston, the eagle has landed. I think even, right, we have this clip. Uh, Houston, the eagle has landed. Now, 6,000 years from now, I don't think people are going to look at the Apollo 11 patch and say, what were we doing, landing birds on the moon? No. We're just symbolically showing, right, that we had the power of flight. And it's the same thing that the Sumerians were saying for... We start to see the similarities. It makes sense that, you know, what, what, what they were depicting wasn't that they actually had wings, it was to say that they had the power of flight. They didn't have any references for spacecraft or airplanes. The only thing flying again in the sky was something alive, a bird. So, uh, you know, only the, the only reference point again is to say that all of these references for the power of flight from ancient cultures around the world, when put into the context of maybe they were witnessing something in the skies that they only had to reference in the, you know, the, the knowledge base that they had, which was, you know, very simple, very simple terms. So now we jump into a term, uh, uh, you know, from, from the Sumerian information of, you know, if there was a great flood, what could have caused it and what information do we have to support this type of a theory of a great deluge? Well, first of all, we have artifacts that show um, reference points or maps being, being drawn that there's really no explanation for the topography of, to have been mapped so accurately by ancient man. This is on a gazelle skin held by a Turkish admiral found in 1513 or thought to have been created roughly from earlier Mesopotamian sources but you know, it was originated in 1513 on this gazelle skin and it shows parts of the continents North and South America still connected and we have other maps that show the same type of topography of Antarctica right where it's basically covered in ice over a mile thick and you can't see the actual land mass underneath the ice unless you're using ground, reddit, ground penetrating radar which we have today to see oh this is the actual land continent versus the ice here it is on maps shown that there's no way they could have known the actual topography other than this was handed down to them by sources that say it came from Mesopotamian sources. Mesopotamia, Babylon, Sumer was the first civilization. So these sources again come from Sumerian influences of knowledge of maps and layouts for the continents that there's just no way they could have mapped this or known this with, with, uh, without the aid of technology. So one of my favorite artifacts to show people is on the British, in the British Museum there is on display the flood tablet and it tells in a, a, a very uh, primitive form of Akkadian script, very close to cuneiform script, uh, a tale of how an Anunnaki, a Sumerian uh, god, chooses um, a man called Utenpishim, a Sumerian man, to build a craft and to take aboard all living things that he could find in the area, plants, animals, his family. But it's a tale that's echoed out in a stone version where, you know, when the, when the curator, it was actually an assistant curator to the British Museum, his name was George Smith. And when he found this tablet while doing an excavation, and I think it was early 1900s, he started to read and decipher this and threw his hands up in amazement and couldn't believe that here he has in stone an actual tale of the Noah's Ark. But it's in a Sumerian derivative that's thousands of years before any known tale possibly the original form. So what's interesting about a lot of these Sumerian tablets, as we see here, this one, is there's 
There's actual physical evidence to show they have echoed biblical tales, just like the Genesis seven days of creation. There are seven tablets of creation that tell a much longer tale of how the Anunnaki came here 300,000 years ago, originally to mine gold in southern Africa. Uh, as the tale goes in the Sumerian text of how this was written, the Anunnaki came here to find precious gold and minerals to repair Nibiru's atmosphere. On the, on, on the Anunnaki's own rise to a technological civilization on Nibiru led them to have atmospheric issues, hole, holes in the ozone as it's described, where they would use gold to grind it up into a powder and patch their atmosphere by shooting this up into the atmosphere. Nibiru is known to be a very luminous, glowing planet. Many people have asked me over the years, how could life survive on Nibiru if it goes so far out into the solar system? Well, one of the theories is, is just like you are what you eat or you're a product of your environment, if you're living on a gaseous, glowing planet, we do see natural luminescence here in fireflies and various other living creatures where if the Anunnaki did live on a glowing planet, all these depictions we see of angels with this halo around them, the Anunnaki actually had a glow about them that if one was to be standing in front of you, you'd be like, he's got kind of a glow to him. So that tale, again, carried over of similarities of the depictions of the Anunnaki to our, what we would call angels, starts to take a physical reality when we find artifacts like this. Here's another interesting thing. There was once upon a time when there were giants upon the earth. So we have many depictions of Sumerians worshiping Anunnaki and they are depicted as a much larger form. Now, I don't really think, because I haven't seen skeletons found or any evidence to point out that the Anunnaki were physically larger beings, I just think they were revered as, you know, very great beings and were depicted as, you know, larger so that they would be uh, more prominent. But it's a very interesting tale, again, when you hear these similarities and we, then we see them in physical form from, from uh, a culture that predates any of the tales found in the Old or New Testament. So one of, the one of the pinnacle points of the Sumerian tale is where the Anunnaki come from. They don't, say they don't say, oh, they come from heaven. They say very specifically that the Anunnaki came from the 12th planet, Nibiru. And we would know that today as Planet X. Now the reason why there's been controversy over the last few years is a lot of people have started to come into the idea of saying, wow, we see evidence for global changes, uh, weather patterns changing, getting more catastrophic. We do support the idea that there was a great flood. What could have caused that great flood? Well, the Sumerians give us a very accurate tale of how this planet Nibiru is part of our creation of the solar system and planet Earth. And they have a very drawn out text that explains how Nibiru, this ancient planet, billions of years ago, and now they describe it in the, in the early times of when the planets hadn't finished becoming solid mass, probably hadn't finished coalescing, this intruder planet comes in, Nibiru, and gets sucked in by the gravitational pull of our outer planets and collides with our primitive Earth. Now this is, we're talking four billion years ago, people, a long time ago. But they're saying that basically the Nibiru collided, or the moons of Nibiru collided with our primitive Earth, which was then called Tiamat, and pushed it into a new orbit, and in doing that collision, cracked it off, making the asteroid belt, moving us into a new orbit, and forever changing the makeup of the solar system. Now the reason why this information is so interesting is, as I'll show you from the ancient sources, there's a lot of evidence to support not only the Anunnaki, but where they came from. Here's a cylinder, or a cylinder seal rendition on a stone tablet that's roughly uh, 45, almost 6,000 years old. And what's interesting about this is it's just basically the Sumerian uh, uh, God uh, granting the Sumerians the plow agriculture, but as a backdrop, you see a complete depiction of our solar system with the sun in the center and all the planets that we know of. Now, why this is so amazing is that through the times of Copernicus and Galileo, we thought we were the, the, the Earth was the center of the solar system. We didn't have any idea that we orbited the sun, yet a complete accurate rendition 6,000 years ago on a Sumerian tablet. And they have a lot of information that not only supports uh, what they say for a 12th planet, but as I described earlier, calling us the seventh planet and counting outward in, there's a lot of information that we can now confirm with our science between the distance of the planets, what they look like in space, 
all described by the Sumerians 6,000 years ago. Now again, when archaeologists were pulling these tablets out of ancient Iraq, you know, in the early 1900s, we didn't, we didn't discover Pluto until 1930. So talk of a, a 12th planet and the outer planets and bird men. All of this information went into a big pile called the myth pile and has basically been untouched by modern archaeologists until over the last 30 or 40 years when people have started to have alternative theories to say, well, what if this isn't mythology? What if these stories are things that have actually taken place? So an artistic rendition, again, just showing the Sumerian makeup of how they counted 12 planets the nine planets that we know of, plus our sun, our moon, and an additional planet, Nibiru, making the twelfth planet. So they have a very interesting tale, as I was describing, of how this planet, they called it an intruder planet, came in and whacked our primitive Earth and forever changed the aspects of our solar system. Uranus is tilted on its side. Uh, Pluto and Neptune, they possibly think, were dislodged moons of Saturn, yet they don't know how this could be. How did they get into their current orbit? Well, a lot of this information is described by, or is put into play with, a, with a, an answer by including an unknown foreign body that came through and has disrupted our solar system. This again is the Sumerian information of how it got pulled in by the outer planets, had this collision with our primitive Earth, and then put us into a new orbit. Now why this is so amazing is the asteroid belt is not enough to make up a planet. There's no real theory as to what caused or what is the asteroid belt other than in the religious text, for instance, we have stories that, like in English, it's called the hammered out bracelet. And the Sumerians very specifically in their texts explain how all of this came into be with this additional planet, Nibiru, coming through the solar system. And when it did that, after, you know, uh, whacking us, you know, 4.5 billion years ago, it thrust us into a new orbit so that it comes around once every 3,600 years through our inner solar system. So Nibiru, I think I have a slide here showing that. No, I guess I don't, sorry. Well, Nibiru's orbit uh, goes around the sun in a very elliptical orbit. We go around the sun once. A solar year for us is 365 days, one loop around the sun. One orbit for Nibiru is 3,600 of our years. Now, they called this a shar. They were the first ones to give 360 degrees of the circle, and they said Nibiru has a 3,600-year orbit, which they called a shar, a completed circle. Another interesting thing that I point out to people is that if the Anunnaki do exist and they live on Nibiru, a solar year for them is 3,600 of our years. One loop around the sun is a year. On Earth, it's 365 days. So, I hypothetically throw out there that if Jesus was an Anunnaki and he came here and he was 21 and said, Hello, my people. I am here. Here's the, some laws and things you should live by to keep your body safe and you know, have a good mind. And I will return. However means that he left. 3,600 years go by because he goes back on Nibiru and it's just been a year for him. He goes around the sun once. He comes back a year later. It's been 3,600 years on earth, but Jesus has only turned one year older. So there's a time difference of all these stories of angels and go to heaven and you live forever. We start to see a scale of scientific purpose to say we can prove that the farther out, just like the astronauts on the space shuttle, their watches start to slow down the further out that they go. It's very possible to say that being on another planet whose solar orbit is much more of a longevity than ours, you could have an increased lifespan. But the payoff for that would be, again, one year on Nibiru is 3,600 of our years. So you go on to Nibiru and you're like, woohoo, party for a year. And you come back and it's been 3,600 years on Earth. So very interesting information that they describe of how Nibiru in, uh, initially interacted with our solar system, whacked our planet, creating half a planet, as you saw there, which leads to another tale of what we would call Pangaea. Because it's known through science that at one point all the continents were connected. Kind of like the skin of an apple is just kind of peeled off. But at one point, the continents were all one landmass and have kind of moved to where they all are. Well, if it was just one landmass, wh what's the other side? Where's the missing chunk? So it's very interesting to see that all planets spherically come into that form, but when put together like a puzzle, it really was just one chunk of land. And we can see how the Sumerian information describing how our Earth was whacked into half a planet, this theory starts to make sense. Water just siphons into a spherical form around our continents. So interesting, inter interesting information. 
And there's our good old half planet Earth. Yes, so here's the orbit of Nibiru, and you can see, again, all of the other planets' orbits. Nibiru has a much more elongated orbit, which makes it very hard for us to track and identify. Now, the information does take a tail into modern tale, uh, modern knowledge, where there was, uh, in, the, in the early 80s, we had a spark where Zachariah Sitchin, this linguist who's been learning about the Sumerian culture and knowledge of Nibiru and the Anunnaki, went to the Naval Observatory in Washington and well, met with the lead scientist, Dr. Robert Harrington. This was in the early 80s. And they, they plotted orbital calculations for the Nibiru, which we see here, and all the information and diagrams that we have, and a modern planet X for what they would call an intruder planet that could have caused why Uranus is tilted on its side. What's causing the outer planets to be pulled in a certain direction? And they said it was a planet X. X meaning unknown, but also 10th, something beyond Pluto. So they started to do orbital calculations that showed that there's something out there pulling on the outer planets, but they don't know what it is. They don't see it. So there's got to be some large mass out there yet identif unidentified. Now, in modern times, we've had all types of information come out over the last few years, a resurgence of interest in the idea of a body beyond Pluto, a 10th planet. They've gone ahead and already wrapped it up. Hey, there's a 10th planet. We're done. No, you're not. There's been a lot of information that comes out of modern sources saying that this little chunk of ice, a Sedna, a Quar, a Xena, has been found and is the 10th planet. The Sumerian de depictions of Nibiru is a planet four to eight times the size of Earth, very large, not a little 800 diameter chunk of ice floating beyond Pluto. So if Nibiru is ever to be found or seen, just like the, Anana or the Sumerians depicted it as a large glowing cross in the sky, it will be a very visual event that amateur and professional astronomers will not be able to turn away from. So what took place, well, again, in the early 80s is Dr. Harrington and Zachariah Sitchin compared their orbital models for the NASA 10th planet and the ancient planet X. And very interestingly enough, this is nothing new, that we see all throughout the last decade uh, new technologies being launched into space, new telescopes, the CERTIF, Hubble, various imaging technologies that are allowing us to peer deeper and deeper into space and start to look for something called extrasolar planets, maybe even some that exist in our own solar system. And we have reports all throughout news, you know, a new far out peer is found, a tenth planet. This information has been coming out in modern science terms to collaborate that there is possibly something out there that we still have yet to find. Now, if we do find this planet, uh, it's very interesting that we could have ancestors that live on that planet. So utilizing the latest technology that we have to search and peer through the, you know, the veil of space, I actually met with the lead astronomer for the CERTIF project, and uh, her name is Dr. Michelle Fowler, and I asked her point blank, is there any possibility that the CERTIF would be able to see something like a planet X in our own solar system, a planet four to eight times the size of Earth? She said, yes. And it is possible that something like that does exist on a very elliptical retrograde orbit. But we haven't seen it yet. Now, this type of telescope would be able to image that. But it has to be focused in a very specific area. You can't just flip it on and, oh, there it is up there. So there's a lot of technology that is aiding us now to start to look into the heavens and find things that we didn't know existed. As an example, what you're seeing here is in the top right corner, the visual light spectrum but then you can see the different light modes that we get out of CERTIF by using advanced uh, infrared astronomy that can basically, um, CERTIF is a, a telescope out in space that is kept below sub-zero temperatures. It's a super cooled telescope and it basically is able to penetrate the veil of coldness in space where there's these massive dust layers that they weren't able to see through. Well, the CERTIF can tune itself to the temperature of these, you know, this dust and see right through it and give us crystal clear clarity of, for instance, galaxies where all those little dots you see are suns. Those are all suns that you see active that could have planets around them. So the sort of gives us details and information that is very interesting information. But it also starts to lead conjecture to new theories which the Sumerians have been saying all along. Here's something that has been recently prognosticated for how our moon got here. They call it the Orpheus theory, an intruder planet Wax our primitive Earth, and the debris coalesces to form our moon. Wow, that sounds oddly similar to the Sumerian descriptions of Nibiru coming in and whacking our primitive Earth, 
and creating the asteroid belt. And here we have it called the Orpheus theory, and you can look that up. So one of the little things I like to point out on the mathematical level is we see here the distance between the planets of their orbits. Well, from Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is, asteroid belt is there's clearly enough room for another large planet to have a free orbit within that area. And a lot of people would speculate, well, you know, is Nibiru, every time it passes through the inner part of the solar system, is it going to cause great havoc? And I think I left this out earlier in saying that this is one of the reasons the Sumerians said they had a great flood is when Nibiru came through the inner part of the solar system, it caused gravitational effects here on Earth that cracked off parts of the ice sheet in Ant Ant Antarctica and raised the water level significantly. So that's what caused the Great Flood by the Sumerian descriptions is this intruder planet has gravitational effects on the, solar, on the solar system, specifically Earth, as it comes through. So people have postulated, well, when's the next time it's going to come through? Is it going to have, uh, you know, catastrophic effects as it has in the past? So I show a simple math here that says roughly 4.7 billion years ago was when this interaction took place from the creation of our solar system and Nibiru coming in. And Nibiru having a 3,600 year orbit, meaning it goes around the sun every 3,600 years. So if we divide 3,600 years by the time it initially entered our solar system, you're looking at over a million times it's made that orbit. So I postulate that not every time Nibiru comes into the inner part of the solar system, where we are in relation to the sun might not always get some catastrophic effect, but it might. So another interesting point from the uh, Anunnaki is they have depictions and stories of what they called Ejiji, which were helpers of the Anunnaki that assisted them in medical and also flying their craft. Well, the Ejiji have very similar characteristics to what we call modern-day gray aliens or extraterrestrials. And they left us small figurines and depictions of what these Ejiji look like. And you can see that they have very similar characteristics to what we would call the modern day gray alien. Large bulbous heads, eyes, very similar to what we know as the grays. And so I've left the theory and postulated the idea that modern day abductions I in fact do take place with anyone looking into this research from Bud Hopkins and uh, Jacobs and just many other, many other uh, lines of looking into this theory that people have been, for lack of a better word, abducted and then analyzed medically, reproductively by these type of beings. Why? For what purpose? Well, I theorize it's very possible if the Anunnaki did create us genetically, they could also be working with another genetic manipulation or another race that's here for their purpose of conveying to the Anunnaki this information. What's going on with us medically, genetically, socially? So it's just, you know, if the Anunnaki are on this planet very far away, it's possible they could have, you know, mitigators that are here uh, kind of helping with their grand experiment. That's just a theory I threw out there, but when we look at these artifacts that come from the Sumerians, there is a large similarity in the descriptions of what they give for the EGG to the modern-day gray aliens basically performing their tasks of doing a medical checkup on us. So very interesting, very interesting information. So another uh, point to start kind of wrapping it up for tonight is one of the things that initially really sparked my interest, I'm 30, 33 next week actually, and what initially sparked my interest as a college student is someone had tangentially mentioned that there are artificial structures on Mars, a face and pyramids. And as a college layman, you know, not having any knowledge of UFOs or, or extraterrestrial archaeology, uh, I was very skeptical to this information and decided to do my own independent analysis and found that while I was attending college in San Diego, there was an organization called Malin Space Science Systems who controls several of the orbiters we still have, the Themesis Odyssey, Mars Global Surveyor, launched in 1998, that are still in orbit around Mars. And here's another one that's going to be launching very soon here in 2007. And uh, these, are, these are all projects that, again, for a long time have been showing us features of Mars that some are under very high scrutiny. Now, I asked Mike Malin, Dr. Mike Malin of Mas Malin Space Science Systems, point blank, is there any possibility that there's artificial structures on Mars, the face, the pyramids, anything? And he said, no, these are all sand, natural wind, weather eroded uh, 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 structures, you know, no alien stuff going on. And that really raised my interest to want to look, in, look into these topics for myself. And so what, I, what I've kind of shown you here is that 
the, there is a lot of new missions that are going to be happening over the next few years where the amount of data and information we're going to start processing is just mind-boggling. If you look here, the amount of data that's being processed by the information, you can see 16 gigabytes, uh, 10, 12, all the way up to 37.4, and then we jump all the way up to 34 terabytes where the amount of information that's going to be able to be stored and collected is just unbelievable that uh, we're going to be able to start seeing clarity uh, released through these NASA images. Now, unfortunately, there's another side to the NASA story of uh, NASA National Aeronautics Association could also stand for never a straight answer because a lot of the information we see comes out of NASA that shows, well, they don't always give us the full picture. But hopefully, you know, with this type of advancements, you can see here the centimeter pixel technology of imaging something versus 30 meters in pixel technology is going to be much more detailed in what we're allowed to see. So, uh, you know, this is very interesting to note that there is a large push by the Bush administration to start to look for or publicly, you know, condone the idea of life on Mars. All of a sudden, water flowing on Mars, salt water on Mars, is there bacteria on Mars? This is the information that's been around for a very long time. But as you'll see over the next few years, there's going to be a, a, a much larger push once again to send orbiters and uh, landers to start getting new telemetry and data. And I predict that in the very near future, this is where first signs of life will be publicly acknowledged. Not publicly found, because that's a joke. It's been there for a long time, publicly acknowledged. So what I like to talk about here is some of the more you know esoteric stuff that NASA has not been able to publicly acknowledge because it's very simple. In the inception of NASA in the early, late 50s, excuse me, early 60s, late 50s, NASA consulted a big, a big think tank called the Brookings Institute, which advised NASA, if your astronauts ever come into contact with extraterrestrial DNA or, for instance, come into a contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, the astronauts would, one, need to be quarantined from the public. Two, the information would need to be quarantined from the public for religious, political, sociological uh, you know, reasons that this would have to be selectively told to the information you know, based upon uh, it, it's, it's, its worth on, on declassifying it to the public. So just some simple stuff that we see here, a comparison of Mars and Earth. Mars is uh, about half the size of Earth. It looks like a dead planet now. And this is uh, one of the initial probes that I got interested in, the Mars Global Surveyor. But these images go all the way back to the 70s when the Viking 1 and 2 orbiters first snapped off this. And NASA labeled it head. And they said, oh, it's just a trick of light and shadow. And it went away after several missions. You know, we took pictures of it, and it, was, it, it wasn't there anymore. Wrong answer. It turns out that, that NASA imaged this face. And you can see that the sun angle must be the sun is over there. You can see the shadows casting down to the, to the angle. Well, they took another orbital pass where the angle of the sun was at a completely different position, and the position of the orbit was at a different angle, and it still looked like a face on a completely different you know, uh, slide. So NASA was like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, we don't really know what to say other than it's just not a face. We're not going to accept that. So this whole region has things being shown that are very interesting. And what I like to point out here, and this is where I will use my laser pointer, is there's also something being shown here that if you look right where I'm doing my cursor, there looks like a terrain change where it's all knobby, bright terrain, and it kind of mellows out into more non nobulous darker terrain, kind of like as if it were water. So I theorize that these are all objects that were built around water. Uh, let me see in my next slide. Maybe I have a better picture here. Okay, here we go. Just like we have monuments like the Washington Monument or the Statue of Liberty surrounded by water, here on Earth we all lived, love to live on beachfront property or by a lake. Why wouldn't that be the case on Mars? It looks like the face and pyramids were built in a way where the pyramids are all on a land mass. Let me go back here. That you can see it looks like right as if they're on a shoreline where the face would be situated out in water that could be looked out by all the shoreline structures and admired. So very interesting layout of saying these structures possibly could be large pyramidal structures that were, you know, at some point an ancient city. And it was surrounded by water, you know, edifying the face as, as a monument. Now, the, the face on Mars has really had some interesting history. And the quality of images has seemed to have gotten worse over the years for some reason. If you look here on the bottom, 
1976, the progression of technology and imaging has gotten worse. Now, I'm not really sure why this is, because it's only for the region of Cydonia, where the, where the pyramid and the face are. There's been other areas that show, and I think I might have a slide of this, that show that there's been manipulation of grayscale imagery, meaning in grayscale imagery you have 256 shades of gray. In some of these areas that were sh shot over Cydonia, there's only 64 shades of gray. They've actually taken out the data. And the actual slides, the raw slides from NASA, you had to Photoshop enhance these and really bring up the contrast to actually see anything. But any other part of Aries Viralis or a part of Mars, it's crystal clear, clear resolution, you know. So it's very interesting. Now this was done in 1998, and uh, uh, you can see that it's very hard to actually make out the face. Or is it? What I've done is taken this face, and I chose the worst one. This was the worst image that they could provide. I'd say, OK, let me throw this back at you. When you take the face and you rotate it so that it's looking at you head on, like a face would be, and I cut it down the middle so there's a left and a right half, look what we get. Left, right half. So if we just look at the right half, what we see here on the right side, it's that one half mirrored, just like our faces are supposed to be asymmetrical. You get this on the right. And it looks very face-like in the sense that we can see eye sockets, nose, mouth, some type of symmetry. But this less eroded left side, when flipped and mirrored, well, hey, what do we have here now? Now we see symmetry that can show that there's symmetry around the face, some type of headdress, eyes nose, mouth, coming out of a monument that was sculpted out of wind and sand. So this, again, is very interesting simula or, you know, symmetry to be coming out of an artifact that's shown on Mars and is skeptically, skeptically known as possibly a face on Mars. But no one really ever analyzes the data where they can split it in half and look at it. NASA has not given the, the fortitude of research that this deserves, but you know, I was able to find five to ten peer-level review scientists with PhDs and imaging credentials to look at this data and say this does merit further study. One of my, uh, one of the persons I am a big advocate of is a gentleman named Dr. Mark Carlotto, who's done a lot of algorithms on the on the Mars telemetry, just as he's done with Russian satellite telemetry, so that we we take satellite imagery of Russia and we can run these mathematical algorithms to say, oh, look, that's actually a tank being shielded by some shrubbery or by a tarp. But the mathematical algorithms would say, ah, it has 98% probability to be artificial. And it pointed out things like the tanks and stuff. These algorithms run on the face and the pyramids show that these have, like the face, is a 98% probability to be artificial. None of this type of stuff was ever done by NASA, or at least publicly talked about. So. Just uh, showing again here that uh, in 1976, this original, the red uh, images, compared to in 1998, they, you can see zoomed in much closer on some of these objects, and they still, versus that time period, look to be pyramidal structures. So I, I, I theorize that if we ever do actually send us back to Mars instead of these little rovers, we might find that we have a much greater history with Mars than, uh, than we really currently know about. So I'm going to kind of go ahead and wrap it up there. I think I have a couple other slides to show you here. But, uh, you know, 